What up my freaks, Ruana Sensight here, welcoming you to part 1 of a brand new Total Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires campaign. With a bang and a moo and a crackle of whips, the oh so long awaited Chaos Dwarfs are finally here. Your votes are in and Zatan the Black will lead the Sons of Hashut in an Immortal Empires campaign. I'll admit it was a hard choice between Immortal Empires and Realms of Chaos, but at the end of the day, the sheer variety of enemies that can be converted into forced labor uh, will be far greater in Immortal Empires. Now before Zatan starts busting labor unions and establishing company towns, a few quick notes. If you enjoy this content and you want to see it updated regularly, don't forget to drop your likes and comments for the algorithm down below as scheduling is tied to engagement. If you're looking to buy the game or the Chaos Dwarfs DLC and would like to support a smaller channel, please consider using my referral link in the description below. I know, I know, sorry to shill, but I am trying to get CA to notice me senpai. Lastly, the biggest of shout outs to you guys for your comments and support. I do YouTube for fun after work hours and your comments keep it fun and keep this channel alive. Now we're going to take a quick look at the faction and the difficulty setup, but do feel free to skip directly to gameplay via the chapters below if not interested. Anyway, Zatan the Black will be leading the War Host of Tsar, which starts up north here near to Village and Cathay, so we've already got some uh, variety in terms of the enemies we can face off. We've got orcs and ogres nearby in the Mountains of Morn, and then Kolek and Archaon to the north in the Chaos Waste. It'll be interesting to see which of them we take as friends and which of them we take as frenemies. Otherwise, the faction effects give us a plus one to convoys, which is a system that is similar to the Cathay and Caravan system, where we send out convoys slash caravans in order to bring back stuff. We'll get more into it after the, uh, well, in-game. And a recruitment cost reduction by 50% for artillery and war machines, which is the stuff I'm very, very excited to try out. And in fact, we do start with the Death Shrieker rocket launcher immediately, but we'll be trying to build up as much artillery and stuff as possible. And as a usual, I'm gonna go for max variety in all armies, so everything needs to be thoroughly tried out. Afterwards, a Lord Effects, we get a plus 15% captured casualties post-battle, which is... Yeah, it's quite sensible. It makes sense from a loreful perspective for Zatan, who is always bringing more bodies in to fuel uh, the industry of the Dowie Tsar. And we got a plus one recruitment capacity, so we can get armies faster for Zatan and any armies nearby. And lastly, an ability called Sadistic Snare, which I'm sure I'm going to confuse and call Sadistic Stare uh, a lot, but uh, it forces an enemy to not be able to move, kind of like Prey of Anathrema. And while it does reduce melee defense by 24, I imagine that like Prey of Anathrema, this will actually be more useful to stop an enemy in its track so that we can gun it down with blunderbusses and glaives and the like. Anyway, that's about it. Let's take a quick look at the campaign difficulty setup. I do very hard, very hard, as I find that to be the sweet spot between difficult and not annoying. And then the end game difficulty is going to be at 150% between turn 110 and 125, and obviously a grudge too far. We will be facing off against the Dowie in the uh, final end game scenario of this to prove who has the best hats and the best beards once and for all, and who whose gods are inferior. Now, that's about it. Let's get to it. I am very, very excited to try this and to see what glorious hats these guys have. All right, Zatan makes sense to me, and here we are. Oh, this is gonna be fun. Uh, let's see, so we start at war, by the looks of it, with the Kazags. So we are at war with the Warriors of Chaos, and it does make sense, Chaos is always fighting Chaos. Uh, it might actually then be a good idea to take Village out and proceed this way, just so that he's not left to annoy us and add Zinchen corruption everywhere. Uh, we do have a bunch of stuff, and I'll take a quick look at how they play here, um, but generally speaking, I'll try to go over the various mechanics of the campaign as we go, and as I learn more about them myself as well, rather 
rather than focusing the first like 10 minutes describing some of the somewhat convoluted mechanics that the Chaos Dwarfs in generally have. But as a basis, how they play the Warhost of Zara or the Chaos Dwarfs in general. So we fight battles and get labor, which is very similar to the uh, slave economy of the Dark Elves, and uh, it's used to maximize efficiency of your industrial economy and boost your military strength. Another other than raw material, well, other than labor, we also have armaments, raw materials, and conclave influence as our various types of uh, of currencies. Armaments are spelt in, spent rather in the Hellforge to increase unit capacities, like be able to recruit more of a single type of unit, as well as strength by buffing them, similar to the workshop in the uh, Ikat Claw uh, Skaven campaign. We can use conclave influence, and we can't access it yet, but we use it in the Tower of Zar to get faction-wide buffs as well well as uh, upgrading and upgrading up the Tower of Tsar. This will be easier to describe once we can actually see it in order to inevitably reach Confederation with the other uh, and the other Chaos Dwarfs. And then lastly, those military convoys, which are like the caravans. Yeah, so this is a little bit convoluted with regards to all of the different types of currencies, but it'll be a lot clearer for those who aren't familiar yet with the Chaos Dwarfs as we try them out. Speaking of trying stuff out, while I'm sure there's buildings and stuff to be built. Ooh, Demon Smith Sorcerer Fire to start off. Nice, and he's got a little, uh, got a pistol there as well. What do you have? Greedy, income from post-battle loot. Oh, that's not bad. And that's not bad. It's nothing crazy, but considering that Zatan will be fighting a lot, it does make sense. Yeah, while I'm sure there's admin to take care of and buildings to take a look at, what I really want to take a look at is how these guys fight. So we're going to jump right into it immediately. Moxia will be our first target, and we'll acquire some labor by that means. Looks like you have, oh, a mix of different types of marauders, one of each. Slanish, Zinj, Nurgle, and Korn, and then a random Chaos Warhound in there. Alright, we're gonna fight this first battle cinematically. It's not going to be difficult, uh, but I do want to see our guys in action, and especially their hats. Here we go. Alrighty, here we go, our first battle with this particular faction. Going to be a fun time, even if it's not a, a difficult one. And our Death Shriek rocket is also going to get its first volley out there. I want to see what the uh, rocket split looks like. Oh, that's nice. That's quite nice. Little, uh, a little bit of fireworks for the enemy. Deadly, deadly fireworks. Let's see if the first volley actually connects. And oh, there's like uh, dragon's heads or something in there. Nice. And there we go. It looks like we will actually get the first shot. I guarantee if that was a hell cannon, that first shot would have missed because they miss every shot. Uh, but anyway, it looks like that one volley did about, let's say, a quarter HP damage to the first Marauders of Corn. And just quickly, while we're a little bit slowed down, I want to take a look at what the units look like. Uh, there is our, uh, our Demon Smith Sorcerer with his gun and his hammer axe. Yes. Uh, we also have these guys. Oh, yeah. Glorious hats. Absolutely glorious. Uh, very nice blunderbusses all around as well. Can't wait to see how these guys perform. And there's our regular Chaos Warriors. Also some decent hats around there as well. And then lastly, our Hobgoblin troops, which are, well, to be fair, not as interesting, but uh, nonetheless. All right, I do wish it wasn't such a dark map, but, uh, well, once we head into Cathay, we'll have all the pretty maps uh, that we uh, that we could desire, and everything will be nice and visible. All righty, we're going to start the battle off by annoying the enemy uh, Warhounds here with our uh, Hobgoblin Wolf Riders. Raiders, Hobgoblin, Wolf Raiders, close enough. And we're actually going to send Zatan forward to pop his first ability on them. They cannot move, and thus they will continue taking damage from our range fire. Uh, this unit is probably the most threatening unit in, on the field, other than the uh, other than the enemy Lord, and mostly because they can get around us and annoy our poor Wolf Raiders, who are obviously going to be very fragile. I do like the uh, way that the arrows of these guys look as well. Ooh, first volley from the blunderbusses. Very, very nice. Ooh, I'd like to hear what they sound like. Honestly, not as much oomph as I was expecting from the blast, but they look really nice when firing. 
And there we go. Looks like the enemy is moving in, and we are going to hold them up as best we can with a combination of Goblin and Dwarf Warrior troops. And mostly it's just a matter of keeping the enemy just distracted and not doing anything while our blunderbusses dish out the damage. And dish out the damage they shall. We've also got a... Uh, we've also got a little bit of work coming in from our unit of... Oh, nice. From our artillery piece, and there we go. Blunderbusses are absolutely wrecking, knocking things down. Looks like the enemy doesn't actually want to go after them, and we are going to reposition them to fire into the enemy's sides. Obviously, this is the first battle, and the enemy has absolutely no chance, and it's impossible to lose, uh, but nonetheless... And there we are, first of the enemies are dropping. Looks like a few of them did move around and try to hit us in the back, but I don't imagine that we'll be taking too much damage. Alrighty, and the blunderbusses have repositioned themselves and are about to start firing once more, hopefully, if they can actually fire past the units. Get a little blast with your uh, pistol there, and there we go, blunderbusses. Right into the sides of these units. We'll, I'll, I'll be expecting the blunderbusses to do the most damage out of all of our units here. Otherwise, the battle is pretty much ours. The bounce of power is at 85, 90% in our favor. Uh, just a few more enemies to kill here. A fireball coming in from our Demon Smith and actually dishing out some damage and exploding in the middle of the enemy formation rather than going directly past them. The rework of the lore of fire visuals and some of the effects is also very, very nice. Lore of Fire was always uh, a very, very nice lore, and now it also looks very nice as well. Alrighty, and it looks like the blunderbusses have absolutely wreaked havoc upon these poor marauders. The map grows darker, so it's a little bit more difficult to see, but most of them are dead anyway, so hardly matters. And there will be plenty more where that came from, of course. The enemy lord, of course, is still fighting, though, and Zatan the Black will be facing off against him, at least in part. I would like to see what uh, what damage the blunderbusses can do to the enemy lord. They're not really meant for this sort of thing. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> I gotta be careful with that friendly fire there, Mr. Demon Smith. Alrighty, Zatan is going to be in by himself. We've moved away the rest of the force, and I just want to see the uh, blunderbusses fire at him a few times. Oh, huh. Uh, the uh, shots from the Demon Smith's pistol can actually stagger foot lords and knock them back. Oh, that's very interesting. I gotta keep that one in mind. All right, but it doesn't look like the blunderbusses are really doing all that much damage. Probably not the best units for uh, this particular uh, job, but that's okay. At the very least, our other units weren't taking damage, which is why we moved those Chaos Dwarf Warriors away. And they've only lost 10 units as well. Anyway, this guy is now able to move again, so Zatan will move back in. And they will not have a duel because Chaos Dwarfs aren't really all about fighting fair. There we go. Nice kick. And now it's a simple matter of surrounding the enemy lord and killing him, or in fact not even bothering as he will rout seeing all those Chaos Dwarf Warriors come back. Beautiful, we don't need to chase the enemy army around, just getting a few more shots with our artillery because we can, and because this is the first battle and the first army is always destroyed. A nice little debut, but I'm sure we'll have much nicer as we go through the episode. All right, there we go. Easy enough first little fight, but obviously the first fight is always programmed so that it uh, effectively cannot be lost. Looks like our blunderbus has actually outdamaged our Death Shriek rocket launcher, which is kind of impressive. Didn't get an opportunity to try out the big blast as opposed to the uh, multi-rocket blast, but I guess there weren't really good targets for that particular uh, thing anyway. I guess we could try it against the enemy lord next time just to see whether it's more beneficial as the enemies will always do the dance to try to avoid the uh, big blast of uh, rockets. Now we can take the labor or we can take a little bit of healing and I I imagine that we will have to fight the next battle right away, but I think in the early portion we're going to need all the labor we can get. So transport captives to get the labor. I'm sure we can overcome whatever is in uh, uh, is in the Fortress of Eyes in terms of defenses. Now, let's start with the admin at least a little bit. So the Volary starts with the Giant Conveyor, which is a drill-type building, which allow gives us the armaments 
as well as the raw materials types of currencies, both of them. So this is pretty clearly absolutely key to upgrade as much as possible, as fast as possible. So we'll need to get enough raw materials to upgrade the ramparts, which means raw materials is the first thing that we'll want. So strip mine here. Slanashi giggle. And of course we will go for, let's see, rush construction will allow us to complete it immediately at the cost of 200 labor. We have a currently quite a bit of extra labor that isn't being used, so I think we'll use this right away to start collecting those extra raw materials. Raw materials are the biggest thing and that we want as much as we can. And also, you don't want too much labor because every additional labor point, well, that it's kind of a weird way to say it, but uh, more labor means less public order, and I don't want to be uh, uh, to spending all our time trying to fix public order. So there we go, strip mine. Now we're getting 300 raw materials per turn. And now let's see. Here we'll want to get probably, yes, money building. I was looking for you. Oh, and it's 250 gold with no real downside. Beautiful. All right, money building is going to be first, and then I guess where the Fortress of Eyes, when it's captured, we will build our first military building there to get our first military units up and running. Nice. All right, nothing else we can do when our labor is balanced at, ooh, very close to what we need it to be, so let's not go overboard. Now, Zatan has leveled up and... You know what? Let's take a look at his unique line. Let's see what he can do. Brutality of Zar gives him personal power. Uh, ooh, yes. Subjugator. Casualties captured post-battle, income from post-battle loot, and labor gained post-battle. So with Zatan in particular, I think we want to uh, lean very heavily into this. And there should be something similar in the blue line, generally speaking. Usually we'd go for cunning, but in this particular situation... Oh, maybe there isn't... Ah, no, yes, there is. All right, so Tyrant gives us income from post-battle loot and labor gained post-battle. So we can combine that with the Subjugator. I like it. Uh, anyway, the Black gives him ward save and... Ooh, early regeneration. Very, very nice. Hmm. Weakness to fire, though. It feels weird for a Chaos Dwarf to be we to have weakness to fire, but I guess his fire resistance does count of uh, counteract this anyway, so not a big deal. General of Zar gives him oh, that's pretty nice upkeep production straight up and a bunch of casualty or punishment rate for more fights and less upkeep. Unyielding command, which is pretty standard skill, haughty resilience. Oh, hello, armor plus fifteen and melee defense plus five. Huh, that's quite interesting. This may actually mean that it's better to lean into certain other types of units than just directly uh, the normal melee types, because Chaos Warriors, or Chaos Dwarf Warriors, as well as other types of these units, are already very heavily armored. Like, let's take a look at the Infernal Guard here. They've got 100 armor. So, putting more armor on them will have, to some degree, diminishing returns. And the Infernal Iron Sworn have 125. Whereas, for example, the Centaurs... Bull Centaurs only have 50 armor, and while their melee defense is pretty okay, getting them an extra 15 armor could make them quite a bit stronger. And same thing with the various Bale Taurus and Great Taurus. How about the War Machines? Yeah, they're pretty heavily armored as well, but, you know, they're War Machines. And what about the Kadai? Yeah, they also could use armor and melee defense, or at the very least the Fireborn could use melee and defense and armor. To be fair, pretty much everything can, so it's a very good point to spend, so we'll start saving points once we reach level 9-ish or 8-ish, uh, so that we can get the main line. Lastly, we have Laughing Killer, which gives him, oh wow, perfect vigor and more damage and enemy leadership reduction. Alright, this is a couple nice combinations of things that we have here. Oh, and another leadership reduction thing. Hmm. Okay, I'm seeing a trend here. We might want to stack leadership reduction stuff on Zatan to lean into this further. Um, but I also like the fact that he has both perfect vigor and regeneration uh, at uh, basically at level 12. Very nice. Alrighty, so the first thing that we will want to do, I think we'll go for Inspiring Presence, then into Root Marcher, and then we'll start immediately getting into Tyrant. Why did I not go Root Marcher immediately? Because we can already reach Fortress of Eyes and we should level up again once we reach it. All right, and now, Tex, we have Tex. Ooh, wait. I do wonder if the Chaos Dwarfs have a uh, an ancillary that they can gain when they're not researching anything. It may actually be beneficial not to... Uh, 
not to research anything right now, just to see if we get any changes in ancillary, since we haven't gotten anything yet. Alrighty, to the Fortress of Oz we go. And what are we looking at here? Pyrrhic victory. The enemy doesn't have a lord, and oh wow, it'll lose all of our chaos warriors to this? Alright, well, it's the first episode, and while this is not a consequential battle, I it's going to be a long time before I get tired of watching the Chaos Dwarves, so I think we'll do this one cinematically as well, even if it is going to be a very quick one. Man, I really wish that uh, there was translations, like little uh, subtitles, for whatever the uh, the units say with regards to their pre-battle speech. It would be a nice thing to have. Anyway, here we go again with our second battle. Looks like the map is very similar, but by the looks of it, at least a little bit brighter this time around. So maybe we'll get a few more nice shots. Chaos maps are dark, but they are very, very cool looking in general. So, and gotta appreciate it. Alrighty, and while this probably won't be a much difficult battle either, just like the last one, there is the fact that the enemy does have two units of Chaos Warriors on the field, and that stats being 36-44, and they do outstats the Chaos Dwarf Warriors by quite a bit, and basically every single stat, other than speed, which is identical. But yeah, they seem to be better in every way, so we do have to be a little bit careful with regards to them. That said, we do have our... Uh, our Death Shriek. I'm gonna be calling these things Fire Rain Rockets. <laughs> For those watching my Carl Franz campaign, I have a problem with constantly calling the Hellstorm Rocket Batteries Fire Rain Rockets. It's too descriptive of a name. So now I'm just gonna be calling every single artillery piece that does similar things Fire Rain Rockets. And no one can stop me. Alrighty, well, anyway, looks like the enemy has moved in some Warhounds as well as some Marauder Horsemen, but they're getting absolutely wrecked by fire from our Blunder Buses. Very, very nice. In combination with those wolf raiders. A few more shots into the poor horsemen, and those will be done. Looks like the enemy doggos did also charge our hobgoblin cutthroats, but with Zatan leading the hobgoblins, we should make quick work of the poor little doggos. Alrighty, and away they go, but here come more enemies. We've established a nice little firing lane for our uh, blunderbusses here, so as the enemy blob up around our units of uh, Chaos Warriors, we will be able to fire at them. A fireball comes in from our Demon Smith, and everybody begins to fire away. Hit him with your best shot. Alright, I just wanted to listen to the sounds of the uh, blunderbusses firing. Obviously, we've deployed in such a way where we can use this uh, little lava plume, whatever the heck you want to call that thing, as a... Oh, gotta be careful with that. That actually wasn't a bad shot, though. A little bit of a clip of our own units, but uh, nonetheless, we use this thing as a pseudo-wall, and one of our units of Chaos Warriors will hold the enemy while the blunderbusses do most of the work. There we go. And let's see, the bounce power is now about 75% in our favor. The enemy Lord unit, the Chaos Warriors here, have been stopped by Zatan and are currently fighting our Chaos Dwarf Warriors, but now with low melee defense, we're going to move our Hobgoblin Cutthroats behind them to hit them in the back together with Zatan to cripple their morale, while the Demon Smith is going to start firing at them from the side and maybe getting the occasional fireball in there as well. There we go, nice fireball, nice explosion. I see a few enemies exploded into gobbets of meat. And here come the uh, goblin cutthroats to hit them from the back as well. And there we go, very nice. Uh, Zatan once again improving his uh, tactical acumen as he destroys these Chaos Warriors without too much difficulty. These guys are pretty much down and our Chaos Dwarfs have not really suffered much in the way of casualties. Get another shot to that pistol, man. I've been uh, wanting to see another one. No? Come on. Man, the reload time on this thing must be pretty crazy. I mean, I guess since it can stagger lords, it does make at least some sense. Or maybe this guy just doesn't want to fire because we have uh, units in, uh, in the way. 
Not a big deal. And out the map turns dark. Perhaps the map turns dark as the favor of the gods leaves the enemy. And because they're just about done for. Over on this side, our Chaos Dwarf Warriors did hold the line against three or four enemy units. And while they did take damage, they were also able to hold them while the blunderbusses destroyed them. And the Death Shrieker also continues working on the enemy. And there was a second unit of Chaos Warriors that will begin to rout under fire from the War Machine and the blunderbusses. And there we go. Second battle under our belt and not too difficult. These Chaos Warriors were absolutely mobbed and destroyed and surrounded, while these guys gotta get the MVP for holding most of the enemy back while the blunderbusses killed them. Well done, everybody. Let's get an even bigger battle for our next one. Alrighty, once again, not too bad, certainly not a Pyrrhic victory or whatever that hell nonsense the uh, auto-resolve uh, like to say. Decisive victory, relatively little losses. I've been having a lot of fun uh, with the Chaos Dwarf blunderbusses so far. And let's see, the Death Shrieker also got 10k damage, very respectable. 5k on the Demon Smith Sorcerer between his gun and his occasional fireball. Not too bad. Alrighty, and this is our third territory, so we already have the Tower type of a settlement that the Chaos Dwarfs uh, have three. Uh, we already have the outpost, which means the last one can be occupied as a factory. And just to give this a quick read, the uh, towers are the main types of uh, areas which can give us access to all the recruitment. Outposts give us raw materials, which use our, are using labor to produce said raw materials. And then factories use those raw materials produced by the outposts and to some degree the towers with the drill uh, the uh, to produce armaments, which are used for upgrades and for unit capacities. Occupies factory. All right, Stone Sky foothills are ours. Now, we have... Money. Ah, oh, we don't have access to military convoys yet. Why? We'll be available on turn five. And we need 75 Conclave Influence to take a look at the Tower of Czar stuff. All right. And I believe Conclave Influence will grow with every single settlement we gain, right? Yeah, plus one gain per turn. So mass expansion as fast as you can go is probably going to be uh, very beneficial to us. Anyway, Zatan, you can now go into Root Marcher. We're probably going to give you the Black Shard Bulwark upgrade as you will obviously have some uh, infantry and then otherwise we'll figure it out. You, Pithuk, should get some spells. Yeah, we want scouting as early as possible as well. But for now... Uh, let's get, uh, let's just see. I assume we're moving to Iron Storm, which has some defenders, but nothing crazy. Uh, we will want then... Mm, for this particular situation, let's get the Flaming Sword of Ruin. We will get the Burning Head for as soon as we run into bigger blobs of enemies. Now, we can recruit a few units already, which are going to be the... Orc and Goblin Laborers. Let's go two and two. Since it's the only thing we can recruit, they're both very weak. Zero armor, garbage, garbage leadership. Uh, but they're expendable units that we can just send in as meat shields, which is what they're for. Uh, we also have an upgrade here in terms of... Let's see, Gunsmith. Give us immediate armaments for raw materials. The gold panners give us money, also for raw materials. And then the miner's workshop increases raw material output. We'll probably want one of these in this particular province, as the drill when will be making us a lot of raw materials and armaments, but uh, yeah. Hmm. Now I wonder... If we take Iron Storm next turn, we can probably construct... This building there, the Hobgoblin Mustering Camp. I wonder if we can reach Iron Storm in one go. You know what? I want to see something. Cancel these. And do this. Okay, no, we cannot reach it in one go. Okay, that's important. So, what that means is we're going to temporarily build a Hobgoblin Muster Camp here. We'll build some troops and then we will uh, delete it right afterward. Then... We're gonna get back to recruiting some laborers of various types. And, ooh, we have a commandment available. I don't know what the uh, Chaos Dwarf commandments do yet. So what we have here is Masterful Architects, Rush to Labor Cons... Rush Construction Labor Cost, eh? And Construction Cost and General Reduction. 
Recruitment cost own armies in province. You know what? Let's go recruitment cost for a turn, because we'll be recruiting some stuff next turn by the looks of it. Then we'll switch to... Masterful Architects afterwards. Military Doctrine to start. Alrighty, not that I imagine the Hobgoblins and stuff are going to be that expensive, but the Hobgoblins being uh, the highest on the uh, Chaos Dwarf Slave tier will be more expensive uh, than the Laborers and such. Also, it looks like we didn't get any Ancillary, but we'll try it out a few more times to see if there's any benefits to cancelling Research. Let us get... ooh, Melee Defense plus six. Uh, plus four and leadership plus six for all chaos dwarfs. We have upkeep production for laborers and hobgoblins. Okay, this is a fairly good early thing to get. Tallest towers give us control plus one for all provinces, but we won't have control problems until at least a few turns in, so it's not a huge deal. The labor quotas give us labor gain post battle. Ooh, that's a hard choice. Immediate labor gain or immediate uh, immediate upkeep production and melee attack increase for the various gabo type units. I'm gonna go- 5% is not that much. You know what, let's go Stronghold Syndrome first for the upkeep and melee attack reduction, just to power up our weak base armies a little bit, and then we'll switch to labor quotas right after. Also, if anybody wants me to go over any particular mechanic in a little bit more detail, do let me know as we go along. But once again, I will, uh, I will go through stuff a little bit more when we actually use it, rather than talking about it and then coming back to it a couple of episodes after, once I and everybody else has already forgotten stuff. And yeah, this is the place where we uh, increase capacities of uh, of units using the infernal armaments and then the manufactory to upgrade stuff. All right. Anyway, I believe that's it for our first turn. So we're going to go Diplo. We're going to double check if there's anything we want to... Oh, wow. Okay, no Diplo. Go figure. <laughs> How do the other uh, Chaos Dwarves feel about us? Oh, we don't even know them. We know only the... Uh, the servants of the Conclave, which hold the Tower of Tsar, eh? Alright, makes sense, I guess. We'll meet Astrogoth soon, I think. He's, like, right here. I think he's fairly close to us. I guess since everybody's technically in the Dark Lands, everybody's somewhat close uh, uh, to each other. But anyway, let's end the turn, then let's proceed to Ironstorm in... Well, I guess not next turn, but the turn after that. Also, for those unfamiliar with the way I do things, as this is a uh, first episode of this particular faction, a uh, few things about the way I do Let's Plays. One, I like to go for max varieties in armies, as in try out all different units. I never use the same army type twice. I don't particularly like using any cheesy tactics to give the AI a chance, as, let's face it, Total War AI isn't the greatest. And I do think that it makes for more fun battles. Uh, in addition to that, I don't spoil myself ahead of time, as I think making mistakes and stuff in the campaign is part of the experience of experiencing something the first time. But I do make the exception that if you guys have any tips or tricks, uh, l let me know in the comments, and I'll be sure to put them to good use. As for unit names, yes, I do name units per your guys' suggestions. Obviously nothing that makes the algorithm angry. Uh, but uh, yeah, do suggest those names in the comments below just make sure to say something like name suggestion in the uh, comments so that I can search for them make it a little bit easier anyway quest issued Gorda's the backstabber oh this is our legendary hero right yeah all right so all we have to do to get this is get a bunch of hobgoblin units okay I think that should be easy enough uh, let's give this a quick read though because I am a sucker for lore especially for specific types of quests a recent uprising of orc and goblin laborers almost spilled over into a full-blown rebellion, if not for the conniving actions of one of your hobgoblin middle managers. Your informants tell you that the hobgoblin had initially joined the rebellion before working his way into the inner circle of the rabble-rousers and promptly plunging his knife into every one of their backs. Of two things, there is little doubt. First that the Hobgoblin's actions were not made as an act of loyalty to you, and secondly, that potential catastrophe to the supply lines had been averted by his backstabbing nature. Yet some damage had still been done, with the leaderless droves of escaped orcs and goblin laborers now scattered to join nearby war bosses. March out to claim back the losses from your workforce, and perhaps find this Hobgoblin to put him in a more useful post. Alrighty, Gordas Backstabber, and ooh, straight up 500 labor. That sounds nice as well. Alrighty, so, Zatan, and what we want you to do is move out of here, go into Encamp Stance, right at the edge of this territory, 
and we'll hit Iron Storm with our own Iron Storm next turn. And we will also get access to Hobgoblin Archers and Hobgoblin Cutthroats, so let's do this. One unit of Cutthroats, two units of Archers, and... Ooh, wait. Wait, wait, wait. We have 100 armaments now, so unless we need to build... Hmm. Unless we need a building to build armaments immediately, which I'm not sure that we do... We can go immediately to here and increase, for example, Chaos Dwarf Warrior capacity, or we save them to eventually increase Blunderbuss capacity. But I believe we can... well, we need another building to recruit Blunderbusses, and this will at least give us another Dwarf Warrior. Yeah, you know what? Let's, uh, let's start off doing those immediately. There you go. Which will give us the ability to recruit another Dwarf Warrior. Alright, so let's go with the regular type. And they can at least hold ground for a while. Uh, we'll have one unit of extra goblin cutthroats, and then we'll do two units of goblin archers. Don't want to go too heavy on the goblin archers, as we will be going for mass amounts of blunderbusses and war machines as fast as we possibly can. Alrighty, recruitment looks good to me. New forgecraft options available. Ah, oh, we can already upgrade stuff. So the first upgrade will be a frenzy thing. But obviously it costs an armament upkeep per turn, and we can't have that right now. We basically gain none, but that's going to change as soon as we build the armaments upgrade we're building here. Labor is fine, and I think everything else is fine. Uh, we'll keep the military doctrine up and running, though. At least for one more turn. Although I guess we won't be recruiting... Oh, wait, no, we have to... Hmm. No, we can change. We can go back to construction cost reduction. We won't be recruiting any more here, at least not any, not for a while. Although, we make a decent amount of money. I'm tempted to get a couple of extra lords. Hmm. I take it that the overseers probably buff various types of gobbo units, huh? Might be decent to have a second stack, like a Skaven Slave stack. Similar sort of, tr uh, similar sort of uh, strategy. Anyway, let's end the turn. Let's storm Iron Storm. And I'd like to do so with much more Gabo units this time around. Remember back when we only had regular goblins, and now we have nobblers and hobgoblins as well. Alrighty, there we go. And now, well, I guess forest goblins. Uh, Stronghold Syndrome is up, so we got Gabo power-ups and upkeep reductions. Lovely. And Zatan, you are ready to move once more. Uh, how many more Gabos do you need for this? You need to get three more, all right, which should be quite recruitable at Iron Storm or somewhere else. Next up, we'll want to delete you, Hobgoblin Mustering Camp. And we could build the next level of the factory immediately. We could also build the next level of the strip mine with money. Or we could save the raw materials to upgrade you. I think we want to upgrade you so we can upgrade the drill to the next level ASAP. Because it gives us everything. Even if it ain't a crazy amount. Plus it'll unlock another slot here, which will mean recruitment of those blunderbusses. Yes, and that's indeed what we will do. And also while we're at it, oh. I'll turn the research back on after we attack, just, you know. <laughs> and just in case, and hello, landmark. Hello, that's our landmark. Battle healing cap for war machines increase. Uh, they can be healed by one of our heroes. Uh, the demon smith, I take it. And then upkeep reduction for artillery and war machines. And increase armaments. Oh, nice. Alright, so clearly, yeah, the game wants us to go here, and ooh, looks like we got Cathians close by as well. Well, obviously, considering the Great Bastion is here, but uh, soon, in terms of uh, we can attack them. Alright. I'm a little bit tempted to spend the money here right now, because these things, these upgrades won't cost money. But this will. Yeah, let's get the Overseer's Camp upgraded. Uh, once we have a surplus of labor, we'll... Reduce the uh, time that it takes to uh, upgrade it, but not now. Alrighty, Zatan, time for your next attack. I take it you don't have any regiments of renown available yet, but that's just fine, buddy. Uh, we should be able to overwhelm the enemy here quite easily. And, oh, it's the same battle that we just fought. You know what? I think just to save on time a little bit, we can auto-resolve this one. It's, let's face it, this, this, they have no chance here. Auto-resolve this one. And don't worry, we won't end this first episode until we see the rest of our Gabos in action. Now, Iron Storm is a... let's see, Bloodwind Keep, Dragon's Crossroad. So Bloodwind Keep is the capital. So the question is, do we occupy this as factory or as outpost? And yes, you can switch those later. But... I think we're gonna start with an outpost, just for more raw materials. We need raw materials for everything. 
Nah, how close it is. Like so, and then immediately... Okay, well, we can't build this until it's tier 3. Although, this would kind of make more sense with a factory. But I guess it doesn't matter what type of... Uh, you can build a landmark regardless, so who cares. Uh, we will go for... Let's see, money pit. Uh, no, we'll go for the strip mine. Oh, we will need labor here, though. Quite a bit of labor. But that's fine, yeah. Strip mine here as well, but uh, we don't have labor yet, so we will not be needing to transfer it. How is our labor here, by the way? 654. Nothing crazy. But we do want to keep saving it up. We'll probably transfer some to Iron Storm. And it looks like we once again did not get any ancillaries, so we are going to go for... Labor increase, like so. And Zatan has leveled up, so why not get even more labor? Tyrant, please. And then you, Demonsmith Pithuk. I guess now it's time to get the Burning Head. Also, we probably want to move at least a little bit through everything here, and then go through scouting. Although we do want those ancillaries. Now, what do you do for us here? Vanguard deployment for War Machines and Strider. Oh, not bad. We will have War Machines in this army. Reforge, so restores the hit points of units with the Hellforged attribute. And then lastly, Infernal Engineer, Missile Resistance for Self, and then Reload Skill for Ally. Duration Infinite. Oh, not bad. So just straight up powers up artillery. Gotta make sure that we keep him close by. Yeah, so these guys are basically the Necrotects of the uh, Chaos Dwarves. Alrighty, well, we have no money remaining. We have very little in the way of various types of... Uh, uh, of various types of other things. And, ooh, I just thought of something. You know what? You're actually gonna do this first. We'll build the strip mine second. After we recruit a few more... Uh, a few more Gabo types to get Gordas in. Alright. Makes more sense to me. Plus, I want to get the uh, nasty Skulkers equivalent uh, for the uh, uh, for the Hobgoblins. I don't remember what they're called, since the re the regular ones are called Cutthroats, but that sounds similar to nasty Skulkers, so... I would have thought that would have been their name. Looks like the enemy will have some defenses of Bloodwind Keep. Lovely. Alright, demolition complete, and new Hobgoblin places up. We can't reach Bloodwind Keep in one round, but that's just fine, because we're going to go to the edge of the territory like so. And we're going to build three Hobgoblin units. I'm going to go with Sneaky Gets. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> and then one Hobgoblin Archer, which will give us eight. I hope that these count the archers. Yes. All right, so we'll get our hero off of that. And There's a little army recruiting here. I'm almost tempted to attack this. I wonder if we'd be able to reach it next turn. You know what? We'll, uh, we'll find out. We could always return to Bloodwind Keep afterwards. Not like there's any reason not to. Anyway, Fortress of Eyes. We have the Volary ready to be upgraded. Beautiful. Now let's start on that so that we can get the drill up and running. We do have... Well, we need a lot more labor. That's what we need. But at the very least, the raw materials continue to grow. The Fortress of Eyes can also build the uh, the armaments workshop as fast as or as soon as we can. We just need to make sure that we get the uh, raw materials necessary for it next turn. And then also build up the... Uh, Build up the extra raw materials out of the Iron Storm. Lovely. Building upgrade available will ignore. Let's end the turn and let's proceed to at least one more battle this episode. I'd like to have a little bit of a bigger one with our legendary hero and then the uh, little battle so far. Alright, not seeing any enemies moving towards us. Looks like Lothar is going to stick around at Bloodwind Keep. All right, labor quotas, and ah, Gordas, you're on the field now. Lovely. And oh, you start with some nice items. What do we have here? Chaos Undivided Corruption in the local province. A little bit of power up for you. Your stats are actually pretty nice. Looks like you're possibly an assassin hero. Physical resistance increase for Hobgobbo units. Casualty or punishment rate for Hobgobbo units. Huh. Interesting. Okay, and then what can you do? Uh, you do have a unique line. Let's see, attribute vanguard deployment for you and various types of Hobgobbos. Ward save for you, and then various hero action things. Frenzy for you, they need stab and a hex ability, and a decent one against lords and heroes. Upkeep reduction for hobgobos, and unit experience. Melee attack and weapon strength, ammunition and missile strength. Okay, so this guy very, very much powers up the hobgobos. And can also even summon hobgobos. Hmm, alright, I'm seeing some interesting aspects to this. And what this means we can do... 
is once Zatan has a few more Chaos Warriors available, we'll essentially build a second army focused around an Overseer plus Gordos to power up a Hobgoblo and then power up a cheap Hobgoblin army as a second host. Makes sense to me. Also, let's keep double-checking the Overseers so that we can get, hopefully, a decent one. And, ooh, wait, it's turn five, which means we now have access to our military convoys. We may want to start using these guys immediately. So let's see what we got. Cannonry experience, so this guy has an extra hell cannon in his little caravan host. And we'll power them up and give them extra range, whereas Mr. Connected here has just a much bigger army in general. Physical resistance and missile resistance. The Lord's army starts with more units. Yeah, I gotta go with the connected guy. It's like real life. All right, uh, hire an ad master. Now, what we want to send you for is labor. We want to get labor. So Castle Drakenhof, labor, and the Crystal Spires, labor. They're both about the same. Money for labor. Money for labor. 331 labor out of Troll Fjord, but it's eight turns rather than five. This has a bigger army, though, so I feel like this might be the way to go. Now, I take it... Oh, wow. Current car... Oh, but it's 13 turns. You know what? I think at five turns, maybe we'll start with something easier like Castle Drakenhof, though I somehow doubt that our first... Uh, uh, our first convoy is going to get wrecked. Castle Drakenhof. You have to go through territory of the Silver Pinnacle, eh? Yeah, all right, let's increase the amount of money that we send, and we're going to dispatch to try to get 448 a labor back. Oh, only seven turns to Grung Zen. Oh, but it's actually for raw materials. Oh, that's tempting as well. All right, well, we'll dispatch you for now. And I'd like to dispatch a second one, but our money is a little bit limited right now, so may... This, this already came up, didn't it? Okay, what, whatever. Uh, yeah, well, you're gonna move into the army, man. All right, are we able to reach this place? No. Oh, come on. Are we able to reach Dragon's Crossing? We are. You know what? Just for variety for the first episode, I think we'll hit Dragon's Crossing. And yeah, it'll it'll mean. Oh, you know what we could do? We could sack it if we wanted to. These guys are at war with Yusag, Kazag, and Puppets of Misrule, but yeah. Oh, I do wonder, are the Kazag at war with Village? No, they're only at war with us and the Imperial Wardens. Yeah, you know what, I like this plan. We'll go to the Dragon's Crossroad, and we'll allow these guys to build up a little bit, although... Ooh, wow, they have a Hell Cannon and a Chaos Spawn. They might actually be willing to sally out and fight us. It'll also give us time to build more troops if we desire to do so. Attack this. And we could ask somebody... Oh, we don't know anybody else, damn. I was hoping to ask somebody to join the war, but oh well. One more fight. Here we go. Dragon's Crossroad. Declare war. It's an easy target, and they have a lot more troops that are going to be forced to sally out into the field. Let's make good use of Gorda's and all of our new Hobgabo troops. Here we go. First battle against Kathena. Their minds are muddled as well, so the leadership reduction. Too bad Zatan doesn't have his own leadership reduction traits as yet, but uh, still. All right, whatever you say, Zatan. And you know what? It's probably actually a really good thing that they don't have subtitles, because you probably don't want to hear the horrific stuff uh, that these guys are saying. Anyway, here we go. I think this is going to be our first proper debut battle. There's a lot of enemies, and while they are primarily made up of uh, peasants with a few jade warriors mixed in, as I recall, it will still be a decent amount of uh, fighting. I do imagine that the peasants are still better uh, than the uh, laborers at the very least least, but would probably be very slightly worse or otherwise on par with hobgoblins, depending on who is buffed more. Either way, I'm going to speed this up just a little bit as we get into position, and just like last battle, we're going to make use of the impassable terrain to our sides to act as a wall and uh, not be worried about this flank. We're going to start the battle off by having our artillery piece annoy the enemy, and obviously going to keep it at least near enough to our uh, near enough to our hero in order to benefit from his aura. First of the Death Shriek rockets away, and let's see if the first one makes contact or connects with the enemy. 
and dropping down the fireworks and right before the enemy call it a warning shot though I don't imagine the uh, chaos dwarves do something like a warning well you know what maybe they will the warning shot means either you uh, either you surrender and work in the mines or you know this happens Ah, damn it. <laughs> I was hoping that the second shot would uh, actually hit. Kind of surprising that it's missing, actually, considering the enemy isn't doing the dance to try to avoid it. Uh, a little bit disappointing in that regard, because just like the Hell Cannon is a little bit annoying when the enemy can't, or you can't hit a unit that is standing still. Or perhaps the AI, knowing the trajectory of the shots, was standing still on purpose. Alrighty, at least the, uh, uh, the third shot did clip a few units and rip quite a few of them in half. But otherwise, we're just going to continue doing this and annoying the enemy with our artillery for a little while until, there we go, the ant hill has been kicked and the peasants march forward. And I don't know what the heck that was supposed to be aimed at, but that's okay. I'm sure you'll find your uh, your accuracy there. I can't wait to compare all the various types of artillery for the Chaos Dwarfs and see which ones are going to be uh, the better ones. Anyway, as the enemy moves forward, I'm just going to take a quick look at our setup here. So we have lines of goblin laborers and cutthroats as the front liners, essentially the expendable units behind the slightly more exp or slightly less expendable units, but still expendable units uh, that we are contemptuous of behind them, and of course the main Chaos dwarfs directly behind them together with the uh, ranged units namely the hobgoblin archers and our single unit of blunderbusses making up the uh, the third line over on the side here we have our two units of orc laborers working together with our single unit of dwarf warriors with great axes as these guys are going to be our offensive sort of flankers oh, and i guess we haven't seen the uh, great axes yet nice i'll try to get Two of those as well as two of the uh, regular kind as well. And then we have our Hobgoblin Sneaky Gits over in the background, who will obviously be hitting the enemy in the back lines, as well as stabbing all those poor peasant archers. I also want to point out that these guys do have a precursor missile weapon, so they can chuck those poison hits or shots as they uh, run in. I assume their precursor weapon is some kind of dagger as well. Otherwise, it looks like the battle's about to be joined, so here we go. Oh, wait, 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 one other thing. Gotta take a look at Mr. Uh, Gorda's here. Yeah, 50, 58, nice stats. Oh, I like the sort of lamellar plate that he's got going on, or the lamellar armor. Lamellar, whatever. Uh, yes, he's got a little axe, he's got a little shield. He doesn't have a ranged attack, but uh, he's meant to kill things and stab things in the back. Dagger of Malice. It'd be nice if he had a dagger to take out. Drop the shield, take out a dagger, start stabbing. Which does melee attack plus 40, base weapon damage plus 100%, and poison. Oh, wow, that's quite, uh, it's quite nice, though it is relatively short-lived. And then Crooked Dice gives a random effect that increases, basically, his survivability massively for 30 seconds. Not so bad. Anyway, now it's time to well and truly start the battle. Our range units are firing away, or at the very least, our uh, various archers and our artillery are. And we will be moving everybody forward shortly. We don't want the enemy to take too much advantage of their uh, range superiority, as they do have more peasant bowmen than we have archers. And thus, we will be charging our gabos forward. The blunderbusses fire once more as the expendable troops rush in to fight the enemy's expendable troops. Peasants uh, versus laborers here. Ah, yes, I see that the laborers are very much scarred up, and here come the hobgoblins to help out as the rest of our troops move on in. A nice shot there. I think that was a burning head, which looks very different now than it did before, and makes absolutely mm, quick work of that unit of peasant archers. It did miss the second one, but they weren't in a nice, neat line for us uh, this time. Uh, we're going to send Gordas to attack the unit of Jade Warriors here, while Mr. Zatan is going to stop this unit of peasant long spearmen and allow the chaos dwarf blunderbusses essentially to fire along them destroy the unit without having to commit any more forces ourselves the orc laborers and the dwarf warriors are also moving in to fight some peasants and they should be able to take care of them while allowing for the rest of the units to be uh, distracted and for our hobgoblins to move in as well and there's the Hobgoblin Sneaky Gits, about to hit these poor peasants in the back. And the others going for the rest of their archers. 
Our archers are also dueling with the enemy here. There's that precursor weapon firing as that were Hobgoblin Sneaky gets moved in. And these peasants are absolutely doomed. Lovely. And the rest are going after the archers, though it looks like the enemy is mostly tied up. Two of their archer units have already been destroyed by concentrated fire from our own archers in combination with our artillery pieces and the enemy jade warriors and peasants are falling in the main line as well, just by virtue of the ministrations of the Chaos Dwarfs, as well as those blunderbusses focusing down the, uh, uh, the scariest enemy units. There is another unit of Jade Warriors out here, but they can take a few blunderbusses to the back, and I'm sure they'll be out. Well, in addition to that, we're also going to be sending forth our Lord and our Hero Gordas to attack the enemy Lord Magistrate, and we're going to pop a buff a Flaming Sword of Ruin on our biggest blob of units. Hmm. With the dark maps, it's actually really nice that the lore of fire actually lights everything up. And there we go, the blunderbusses have returned. They were having a little bit of a difficult time firing over this hill, but now into the backs of those Jade Warriors, and the Jade Warriors will get knocked down or otherwise ripped apart. I'm sure a few units are going to hit the gobbos here, but who cares about these expendable troops? Alrighty, and with that, I do believe the battle is pretty much ours. We can see our forces advancing in ever, from every single direction. The enemy army will, in fact, quickly shatter, and the battle will end. We also did have our uh, Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders, which did get hurt at the start, I will admit, a little bit from the uh, enemy archer fire. Uh, they're just going to chase down, or they were chasing down enemy troops as they routed, as obviously we didn't want those peasant archers coming back. We didn't get too much work out of Zatan and Gordas in this particular battle but at the very least oh wow this is that's one happy goblin <laughs> oh look at that smile he's he's so happy uh <laughs> uh yeah well, i guess he got to stab some backs today and it uh it uh and made him a happy camper. Uh, yeah, so these guys did manage to kill the enemy lord, but basically once the enemy army shattered. So it was mostly the army that did the work, but I'm sure uh, that the overseer units appreciate that anyway. There we go. Decisive victory and our first Cathay in battle out of the way. Yeah, and we finally got an item out of that. Very, very nice. I am glad of that. We are going to, let's see, get 87 labor, a little bit of money, a little bit of XP. And we are going to turn the place into a factory, since the other place was a, uh, the other place was an outpost. Lovely. Occupies factory. And that does not yet complete the territory because we still need to take I, uh, Bloodwind Keep. Uh, but it is nice to have. And on top of that, I think we can immediately build the factory guardhouse here. And just because I do imagine the Cathians will be a little bit salty about this whole thing. Zatan leveled up to level 6 and thus has two points available, which means more points in Tyrant, more income from boast battle loot, and more labor to spend on stuff. Beautiful. Alrighty, and we need to... let's see. Alright, you're not doing anything with the labor yet. I guess we could technically... oh, we don't... <laughs> Oh, we can't actually rush this construction here. We do have plenty of labor here, so we could rush something if we wanted to. I'll think about it. Because uh, our labor losses are also going to be increased by percentage, so we don't want uh, high labor to be wasted. We can also build something in the Fortress of Eyes as well, like the armaments thing, since we do need it. It will reduce our general raw material up in upkeep, or the how much we get, but we can build it from Iron Storm as well. Yeah, I think that's probably the way to go. Anyway, I'm think I think with that, this is pretty a pretty good place to end the episode off, so I am going to call it here, and now that we've had a little bit more variety in terms of battles. Next time around, we will be moving on towards Bloodwind Keep and attacking the uh, Chaos Warriors there, and maybe getting a second lord up and running to uh, uh, tote around Hobgoblins. Also, as soon as the uh, Ramparts are finished here, we will build the other dwarf, or the dwarf recruitment building here. 
which will allow us to get more Chaos Dwarf blunderbusses on the field, or possibly even the ironworks for more machinery, now that we're building up the uh, armaments building, especially, since we will actually be able to afford it. As well, we might proceed towards Village and fight him. I still haven't decided whether this is actually a good idea or not. You guys let me know what you think. I just feel like it might not be a good idea to keep him back here, especially since Chaos generally makes very poor allies, as the outposts don't really give you any of their good units. While well, the warriors of chaos, anyway, a little bit different from the uh, for the demons of chaos mm, types of armies. Anyway, more Zatan to come, so stay tuned. Don't forget to leave a like and comment. All glory to the algorithm, and thanks for watching.